Welcome to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen, or welcome back. I am going to do this episode, as you can see, I think about it, and it's going to be about a situation that a lot of us get into from time to time, almost cyclically. And, you know, you may only have it a couple times in your whole life. You may have it once every five years. Who knows? But it's one of these things that hits us all, and we feel very isolated when it happens. And it's feeling trapped. And obviously, it can be trapped in a bunch of different senses, depending on your age and your status in life. You know, I can just speak from my own experience that when I was young, I felt trapped at times almost in waves of nonsensical thought. Like, um, I swear to God, there was a moment when my father was driving us outside of town. I think we were just on a joyride. I can't remember. We went out east of town, and I think just before the bridge, it had rained quite a bit. I think we were just driving to take a look at sort of how the fields were filling up in Kansas, because it could be kind of interesting to see a field just full of water. At the time, I didn't know the impact of that. And I remember looking out the window, because I'm on the passenger side, and he's headed south. We had just been going east, and I look to the right. And it was just kind of a rainy day. Um, Felt like it was spring or fall, somewhere in there. It was definitely cold. I remember that because we were all bundled up. And I just thought, oh my God, I'm trapped here. I'm trapped in this little hometown. And what was funny about the feeling was that I loved my hometown, even back in those days. But I was wondering where I was going to go, maybe. And I hadn't, I think I was 13 years old, I swear to God, I I may be wrong about that, but that's, the reason why I think that is that I moved back to my hometown at that age. And so I just remember thinking, wow, that was a weird, it was a weird, strange feeling. I want to say, you know, maybe a ping of insecurity about my future, but it was more of like that feeling of, man, I think I can do a whole lot more than I'm going to be allowed to do in this town. And so I'm 13. What do I, I got no money. I just started, I would have started working later that year, but you know, you make 200 bucks in a month as a 13, 14 year old kid. What are you going to do with that? I'm going to buy me a car and go to California. And then I didn't have that feeling for a really long time. And it wasn't until, you know, I started getting jobs, I think in the Bay Area, where, you know, I was doing really well. I was making decent money. And you just kind of get that feeling that I've talked about several times where you feel like you're trapped in a job. Even though it's very successful, you're thinking that, oh, no one else will hire me, that kind of thing. It's just this weird thing. It makes no sense. But that's all, you know, personal, professional stuff. Uh, It's all going to be personal, I should say. You can be in a weird relationship where it's not working out and you're like, geez, what am I going to do? There's some definitely some conveniences here, but it's not really feeding my soul. And then as you're younger, you stay idealistic because you have a lot of years left. You know, say you're 25 and you're like, I don't know, this relationship isn't really fulfilling me. You try to do what you can to communicate. It's not working. They're not mature enough to listen to what you have to say or they're set in their ways already. Oh, there's just some weird difference between the two of you. You got plenty of time to get out of that relationship and find something new. Now, fast forward 10 years, you can still do it. But boy, especially if you're a female wanting kids and you don't have any, you're really playing with your biology, especially with all the uh, chemicals out there that are trying to, you know, cut off your reproductive organs as fast as possible. 45, ooh. Now you're really just living for yourself. You're just trying to be with a partner that's going to work out for life sort of thing. And you can go through these emotions with the job, with the relationship, with the situation, and you resolve it. You feel better. But what do we do? I mean, you know, it's one of these things of there are so many emotions that an adult goes through. And they're sometimes just bottled up inside of, you know, catchphrase conditions like midlife crisis or something like that. I think the biggest misnomer about midlife crisis is that it happens nowadays way before midlife. What is midlife? You know, let's say you live to be on average 80-something years old. So I guess if you have one around 40, it's midlife. 
But you could have one when you're 23. You could have one when you're 32. It's just that things are moving forward and you don't feel like you have control. You had some visions for your life, things you wanted to accomplish, and they're not happening or they haven't happened yet. I am going to hopefully gift you with some of my own experiences and the metrics that will help you have faith in practical, real, empirical facts about why you're probably okay. Or you can make it okay if you need to. You know, it's one of these things where sometimes we just need friends to talk to us and we don't know. We know how we feel, but we don't know how to fix it. And if you knew how to fix it, you wouldn't uh, have a problem on your hands. So you wouldn't need your friend. You just fix everything as soon as it happens to you. So that's what I want this episode to communicate to you. You know, Van Halen had the song Change. And, you know, one of the lyrics is, nothing stays the same, change. Keep the clock running, change. Change is your biggest friend in the entire universe when it comes to ever feeling like you're stuck in life. Because there's no metric anymore in this universe that we experience that isn't forced to change. Now, obviously, we can overlook what we typically talk about, which is changes that are negative in our life in terms of outer forces messing with us, with us, right? When I was younger and I would go through moments of feeling like, man, I'm just in this, I'm in an apartment, I'm in a place in the world I'm not necessarily a fan of, and I don't have all that knowledge. I'm 23 years old or whatever. I've barely, even though I've done quite a bit up to that point, you know, it's like it's all, it was all just falling uphill. Things were just going my way <laughs> just because it was strange. I was working hard, of course. But the more that I watch myself go from a point of being discontent with an element of my life and then without really paying attention because I was too young and, and not awake, non-sentient to this sort of, sort of thinking, and I'd find myself in a better spot and I'd look back and I'd go, man, you know, that, that did fix itself. And again, I used to do this thing, and I've mentioned it several times in the past, but the one reason why I was able to track the progress and it may be like manifesting is what I did. And I've, I need to figure out a way to rebirth this in my life because it was really cool. What I did was I created what I called, like, I just picked a name. It was like the self-seminar. I would get a, a big, giant cassette tape, like a really long one, double side, of course. And I would record what I had accomplished in the last year. And then I would... That's usually, you know, try to spend about a side doing that. And then the next side was what I'm going to do in the next year. So previous and next. And that, and usually before I would record the one that I just made, that I was just going to make, I would listen to the previous year. Somewhere those tapes exist and I have lost track of them in my house and it's kind of nerve wracking. I did my first one when I was 17 and still living in my hometown, which is a trip. So I got to find them and buzz them down to digital. But that allowed me to track exactly what took place. And, and, you know, part of your, part of this situation for me was to get to the nitty gritty of how I was feeling about something, how I felt about someone. You know, it was like, even if I was totally discontent with someone, angry at someone, I would, you know, tactfully put that in the tape. And then, you know, a year later, I don't feel that way anymore. And so it showed me how my mind was evolving and how I was changing my opinions about things, how I didn't have all the facts about something, perhaps, right? But there was a there was a story I've shared a long time ago, and it's very applicable to this. And it was it was sort of one of those epiphany moments. I had moved from the Bay Area, making tremendous amount of money, and you know, transitioning from Northern California, Southern California, knowing not a soul. Loving the location, but not knowing a soul was so tough. I mean, it was a miracle I got the rent paid. And it, it caused my credit to get destroyed. And my credit was like 850 And it was like 580 at one point. And I don't really subscribe to the slave number anymore. But I needed to buy a new car. 
And my car was slowly dying. It was over 10 years old. It was a good car. I ran it really hard. I still own it, but I went and tried to qualify for finance. And the dude ran the numbers on it. And he, you know, he was just a gentle soul. I think my girlfriend was with me too. I'm not sure. But I'm sitting there talking to this guy and he goes, well, you know, he just kind of lets me know that the numbers are really bad. You know, you're not going to be able to get any financing unless you could put down like 90% of the car, that kind of thing. And maybe even that would be tough. And he said, you know, my father told me once, he said, life is made of peaks and valleys. He says, right now you're in a valley. He said, but don't worry, a peak's coming up. And what's funny about that was it was probably about 2004. And by 2005, I had started my game company. By 2006, we got it roaring. In 2007, we're rolling it. He was right. But I will tell you this. I understand how difficult it is to believe that things will change sometimes. Even if you lose someone out of your life, and you can put whatever type of loss that is, you think that people can't replace people. And they really can't. But you can definitely fill a void with some other wonderful things. And it's usually because you haven't ever experienced certain types of loss before. And so you don't have any mechanism in your mind to go, well, well I can recover from this. Imagine being an artist, a painter artist with your right hand. And some accident happens and you lose your right hand. And you're like, oh my God, my whole life is over. And you don't remember that you can teach your left hand how to paint like your right hand and that there's plenty of handicapped people out there, disabled people that have lost limbs and kept going. Remember the Def Leppard drummer? The dude lost an arm. Okay. He was the drummer for one of the most popular 80s bands on planet Earth. And he was still in the pocket when this car accident occurs. Meaning he wasn't in the 90s after he had made all of his albums. And he has to recover. I mean, this dude is like a beacon for any of us believing we can't get over things. And there's thousands and thousands of people out there that go talk every day who had it and then lost it and then reconstructed. Now, some people are born with arms and legs and they will show you a whole different level of dedication and perseverance and just not acknowledging they never knew what arms and legs were like, so they don't care. I mean, they're just like, dude, I just, I handle business, you know, but he worked with a team. First, he had to physically recover. He works with a team. He built a drum set that can actually work with foot pedals to replace his right arm. And then he's got to teach his body to replace all of those drums. And he mathematically figures out if he hits something with his left arm, can't, I, I don't remember exactly what it was right or left. He needs both. Let's just put it that way. He was able to double up some of the sounds and things, and he was fine. You know, I think he did tour with another drummer to help eventually, but tremendous, inspiring, amazing, you know. But now let's go to the next level of this emotion because I know you understand the basics quite well. One of the added extra elements that can get in the way of your recovery is uh, the situation where you are, are seemingly out of energy to rebound. So you were down and someone kicked you. Not someone specifically, but just life in general kicked you again and maybe kicked you again and kicked you again. You're like, oh, my God. You know, if you were struggling with employment just before lockdown happens, oh, my God. And let's say your career is in something that's locked in. Well, then you're like, oh, my God, I just about got my, you know, nose over the water to breathe. And then poof, everything gets pulled. It happens, doesn't it? So what do you do in that scenario? What do you do in that scenario? Well, you can play some games with your mind that actually are just as good as reality because I believe that you can manifest whatever reality that you have faith that you can manifest. And then that might be way outside your wheelhouse of thought, and you're thinking, oh my God, here we go. Stick with me for a second. The first exercise you might engage is to say, okay, one, you're down and out, and I'm not sure exactly what that might mean. I, I would usually say there's a, an emotional element to it, say in a relationship, there's a financial element in terms of your employment. But in the end, the first thing we need to say is that hopefully your health is intact. 
such that whatever is out there can't just take your life. You just, you know, you, there's no problem waking up the next day. That's huge. That is huge, and that's sovereignty and and beauty, you being alive. And if you have never experienced some sort of near-death experience, it doesn't really matter. You know how to find, and you probably already know stories of people that have sort of uh, been cavalier with life and maybe even got depressed and even contributed to a potential loss of their own life, got to the very edge of that game and rebounded back. And all of a sudden, they're a reborn person. And I will tell you that in my life, it's all ages. And I would say at least 25 and up. I mean, we have to go with at least a sentient adult. Now, some people could do it younger. That's just because they're more advanced in the mind. That's all. So lean on those stories. Lean on those truths because those are true stories where just being alive the next day means anything can happen. And that's a cool thing. Oh, yeah, you know, debt collectors can call you up all they want. And it's like, hey, if you got money, of course you would give it to them. But if you don't need money, what can they do? They don't pick you up and put you in handcuffs, right? Unless it's fraud. But we've got a global situation going on right now. So if you're suffering financially, there's a global situation going on. In terms of stuff, I've had friends way before 2020 who spent money unwisely. They lost their homes with wives and kids, young kids. The husband has to look the wife in the face and say, I'm sorry, because if I hadn't spent the money the way I did and convinced you that this was a good investment, we would have all that money and we wouldn't be getting kicked out of our house and moving in with my mother. It takes a hell of a thing for you know a spouse to endure that with another spouse and stick with the program. But it does happen all the time. But now, I'm going to take a slight tangent and get, and then loop back in to give you an example of one of the things that people never think about when they lose their stuff. Now, usually you don't lose all your stuff. You don't necessarily go homeless or something like that. You typically, I mean, have a friend or a family member where you could store like the absolute irreplaceable heirlooms of your life. You know, your VCR is not an heirloom, you know, your whatever, your, your TV or whatever it is, right? Some old piece of hardware. It's the photographs of your family that have been printed. It's something that you created that just can't go away. Your hard drive with all your stuff on it. You can always find a place to safely store that typically. Okay. But I used to, I still, I don't, I haven't had to say this in a really long time, but my friends who acquire a lot of stuff in their house and that should be donated at some point. And typically clothes are the big one that comes up in conversations of the past. And, and they, I'd say, you know, you should donate all that stuff and go get new stuff. Oh no, I can't. No, no. You know, it's like, again, if it's your grandfather's sweater or something, I'm not asking you to get rid of something that's absolutely priceless to you. So when I get the resistance, I'm prepared because this is my little shtick with people. And I say, well, do you like buying new clothes? Do you like wearing new clothes? Oh, yeah, totally love wearing new stuff. Okay. Well, imagine this. If you donate all that existing stuff that you have, you can go get new stuff. And maybe you don't have enough money to replace your entire wardrobe at one time, so just donate what you can and then replace it slowly over time. Get yourself a new shirt, a new pair of pants, a new pair of shoes. Once a month, you donate something and you buy something new. And it's funny, I have converted probably three out of three friends in that scenario. One of them was a girlfriend of mine that resisted for a long time. And then she realized she loves buying new stuff. And so now for her, it's a machine. She donates good wearable clothing and gets brand new clothing. Not like every day or anything, but when she goes through her one-year purge, one-year purchase, she's so happy. She's like, yeah, why didn't I do this before? And let's face it, there's people in need that need to buy things that are actually wearable. And sometimes, if you have a church or something, you can give it right to the person. It just depends. You know, your kid's uh, 14, growing like a weed, and you just grab all their clothes that are just fine, you hand it over to another family that doesn't have a lot of money, and you go, here, these are really expensive clothes, and they're pretty much brand new. My kid wore them for one year. 
ready to keep rocking and rolling, right? Or whatever it is, right? The key reverse tangent back to our game has to do with simplifying your life to make sure that you don't make the difficulty rating of rebirthing yourself as high as possible. So what you want to do is bring down the difficulty when you find yourself in a negative situation. Anything that's going to fight you from getting back to where you want to go has to be pushed to the side at least. Maybe you have a place to stay and that's not the issue. Maybe you're trapped in a job that pays the bills and you're paying the bills just fine, but you're like, damn, I don't like this job anymore. I don't like my boss anymore. They switch bosses on me and this person's awful. A situation happened at work where everything was fine and then I said hi to that girl or that guy and then they, they can misconstrued it and now there's tension. I should probably just find another place to go because it's just never going to end. You need to start, in my opinion, writing down And I'm going to tell you, if you write it down on a piece of paper with a pen, you give a chance for the gods and the spirits to read what you wrote. If it's all stuck in your head, that might be a domain that only God himself can get into. And you may only need God, but he does delegate. (laughs) I totally believe the dude delegates. But it also manifests reality. There is a chance that this entire game that we're playing right now is a manifest reality. It's a consensus reality. You have conceded to this reality. You've conceded to these laws of physics. And so, if I said to you, okay, no longer believe in gravity, because you're in a human body, and by the time you hear my voice, you're definitely a couple decades into life, there's just probably next to no method for you to negate that belief not subconsciously, so it stays on top of you. Okay. The amount of people that I have seen engage in this exercise that I'm about to share, and you guys know about this, and get what they want is pretty incredible, which is they paint the reality both in words and like a list, and the more they describe what they want, the more they understand what they need to do to get it. It's almost like there's a you know, again, like I used to say a long time ago, there's, there's a, obviously steps between where you are right now and where you need to be. You just don't know how many. But if you don't take any steps, you're never going to find out the count. And you're going to think one step, you're going to think uh, one particular aspect of your goal is going to take 10 steps, and it's only one. At one you thought was one step, it's going to take you 10. I'm starting a, uh, a new YouTube channel where I'm going to teach 3D. And I thought, oh man, I'll bang out the logo real fast and then the classes will be really tough. Well, it's the opposite. The logo's kicking my ass and the classes are easy. But it's important because people in 3D have really cool channels and really cool things, you know, really cool visuals, uh, but, you know, to, to kick off their lessons and to transition from one lesson to another. But the other one is these are these image boards. And again, it's a little tougher in the digital age because printers are so shitty nowadays, no one prints anything out. And so no one owns a printer that's functional. But it used to be, you get magazines and cut them up and put them on your wall, and it would surround you with things that you want. You can play with the desktop of your computer, whether it be a laptop or a desktop, but the problem is you're always running a window on top of that, so you never even see it. So that doesn't work too much. You might use the screen on your telephone, your, uh, your home screen and your internal screen, but it's covered with icons, or you don't look at the sleep screen that much, you know. So externalizing out what you want so you can visually see it as a reminder will do a couple things for you. One, you know when you learn a word and you've never heard it before, but the second that you learn it, and you learn how to use it especially, you hear everyone else using this word all of a sudden, and you're like, man, did this word always exist? Or did I manifest it in my reality? I actually can't answer that question. I used to think we just noticed it more, but now I'm not quite sure if I'm just adding it to, because I can believe that I've added the word to my world, so reconceding uh, the world to a new definition that uses this word might just be the case. But take that little phenomenon and attach it to your individual elements that will get you to this rebirth of who you are as a person. Now, the other 
element after you start surrounding yourself with this imagery and getting the echo between you and the imagery is do a little soul searching too. Because a lot of times what ends up happening is we get obsessed without realizing it. We think things are important that aren't important. You know, when you have a lot of money, you spend a lot of money. That's typically how Americans do it. And then when you get broke, you're like, oh my God, let's turn off Netflix. Let's turn off Amazon Prime. Let's, let's turn off all these subscription services I've got all around the world that take out 50 bucks, 100 bucks from my bank account every month. And then all of a sudden, you have an extra 100 bucks in the bank account. You stop eating out all the time, so you never longer have $70 dinners for two people. You cook at home, and all of a sudden, you got hundreds and hundreds of dollars in your bank account that you didn't used to have. Oh, my God. And you start realizing that your priorities grew. And, you, you know, don't feel guilty. You're just testing the waters. You're just enjoying You're the spoils of what you did. But okay, so just like when we tell people that catch cancer on this show, you want to stop eating meat and sugar to starve the cancer. Then take all the supplements that are the nature's chemo, B17, C, pound that shit. Do the cruciferous vegetables. Do spike all the good bacteria in your gut to help fight everything your immune system typically does. And now your immune system's just killing cancer for a living, right? But that first, those first two are really tough. Kill the meat, kill the sugar. Well, who the hell doesn't, if you eat meat, you know, it's like you eat meat and you, sugar's in everything. Those, that's the first two tough steps. And that doesn't matter if you're going to go do chemo and kill yourself with some radiation poisoning. Those are the first two tough steps to take. So anytime you find yourself in a rough spot, yeah, you're going to have to take a few steps. But now here's the cool thing. Seriously, this is the cool part. Every single thing you do that you can tangibly do to address what you are trying to rebirth in your life is progress. It's a little win for you. But digging inside your soul, digging inside who you are as a person, did you get a little too uptight? Are you not uptight enough? Are you too relaxed with things that, that really need a lot of attention? Did you lose your job due to a failure in your performance? Just a temporary failure. You temporarily, maybe even for a year, you just kind of got relaxed, you know? It happens. The whole idea that man works five days a week, eight to ten hours a day, is a new joke on society, right? It wasn't like that a couple hundred years ago. It wasn't. It wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that we got to the point where, even as an intellectual human being, we started doing these, going inside giant buildings and working in cubicles. We were agriculturalists. We went out and worked a farm. Now, you could work a farm for 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day. But it was much more, to quote the phrase, the pun, meat and potatoes kind of work. It was a trade skill. It didn't tax your mind, tax your mind so much. And it was guaranteed, as long as you rotated your crops properly, to work the next year and the next year and the next year. And you have a flood and a freeze and you get a little pinch here and there. But it was much more straightforward, although backbreaking at times. Imagine being 60 years old, continuing to do that. That's why you got to use it so you don't lose it kind of thing, right? I would say the last five years of my life, and I would say, honestly, this year, has been an extra, almost involuntary evolution in my personality of being more, uh, I should say, like um, genetically relaxed in that, but still working my, my butt off and really cranking out some good meticulous uh, fine detail stuff in 3D, you know. But I was able to go from perhaps being slightly more tense kicking out one level of quality, let's just say a seven on a scale of one to 10, to being more relaxed and more calm, kicking out an 8.5 to a nine every once in a while. I don't know if I'll ever do a 10 in my opinion. We'll see. The other thing is to remember, especially just with the voice I'm giving you right now, literally, you're not alone in this game. You're absolutely positively not alone if you are feeling trapped. So don't feel, again, like this is a unique emotion you're having all by yourself. To thus compound the feeling that you're completely by yourself or that somehow you have failed to some epic scale that you're the only one that has ever felt this way. Or that it's so 
it's so rare that, you know, out of the town that you live in, you're like the only guy or girl that's feeling this right now. You have to understand that this is a very common emotion that, again, can strike like it did when I was 13, where that feeling probably lasted no more than 10 to 20 seconds, but it was very profound to the point I can still remember in my mind looking out that window, seeing rain come across the passenger side window, the time of day, the field full of water, and just having this weird feeling. It was a very uncomfortable feeling, which is why it left such an impression on me. So please know you're in the human condition, and this is just part of the experience. Now, I'm going to briefly touch on, because I've got plenty of episodes that talk about sort of career upgrades. It can be that what you were doing in the past is no longer a profession. That's really a big deal. I had an uncle of mine that got really into um, the printing presses of the newspapers uh, for a big newspaper in Wichita, Kansas. And it was in the uh, 80s, early 90s. And, you know, newspapers started dying off as the internet came on on board and, you know, they're downsizing, that kind of stuff. So I think, I mean, he had a degree in computer science and so he had no problem. He could teach it and all this other stuff. But I'm sure, and I've never really talked to him about this, but it was just something we all knew about. And I'm sure that he struggled at times to uh, to reconcile this notion of, oh my God, I'm an expert working software, computer software for printing presses, and now the printing press is no longer going to be this the the main show in town. And newspapers are downsizing, that sort of thing. So it could be, for instance, you're in some sort of profession and it's going through a lull, if not a kind of a terminal decline. Well, those are pretty rare. There's usually always a niche for something. So again, before you hit rock bottom, if you're feeling trapped, you... Sometimes you're at rock bottom and sometimes you're approaching what you perceive to be a rock bottom or you're just feeling trapped. It's just a sustainable frequency of, ugh, you know. Again, always use your uptime to reinforce yourself and diversify yourself if you possibly can. I give you a kind of a, a similar analogy. When I've had at times, you know, half a dozen celebrity clients that I'm doing like online properties for, special projects for. But, you know, again, I get to know them through their websites, that kind of stuff. It's just a little side thing. I would go to them when they were really, really successful, and I'd say, hey, we should probably upgrade this site. And they were like, "Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so successful right now, I don't need it. I don't think that's controlling my fame. And I never asserted such a thing ever, right? So the funny thing that happens is that when they go into a lull and their finances aren't great, that's when they want all the freebie stuff. So they're not paying me when they're really uh, wealthy because they don't want any new stuff. They always pay me when I first get started, that sort of thing, or I donate or whatever. It's like someone I'm a fan of. But when they had the money, they didn't invest it in themselves. When they had no money because they started failing, they want to pull every stop on promo. And then they want to get a discount on everything. I can't tell you how many times that's occurred in life. But we do that to ourselves as well, don't we? We should be investing in ourselves when we're kicking ass and taking names. But we don't. Sometimes. Now, obviously, I was, you know, I'm talking about change is something that just happens and you can't control it. And a lot of times that's a great thing. It may not be a great thing in the short term. Change is occurring, which is causing you to have issues like being locked down or something. Now, you know, there's always fears that that stuff will never, ever stop. And certain countries are still dealing with this issue. That drives me nuts. But we know it won't continue forever. And even if it did, they're going to have to do something about keeping people working. You know, they just have to at some point. Okay, you're locked down, but you can do this, this, and this, and this, so you can work and, and have a life. You know, change just is, is the constant of the universe that drives the globalists crazy, to be honest. They want everything to just be under their control and, and nothing can change that. But they can't do that, right? And death is the blessing of all of us that have to listen to them because you know, they will not make it there, you know, forever. So there's, that's a, a comment about external change. The other change is inside you, like I said. 
So check yourself and see if there's any attitude that you've had towards yourself and towards your career and towards life and perhaps even towards others if it's a personal issue and not a career issue to see if you need to change. And really spend some time on it. Spend some time thinking it through. Again, pad and paper is so utterly profound. And I will tell you what, you know, there's there's always a retro movement going on somewhere on the internet, somewhere in the world where, hey, we're playing uh, old Atari 2600s again. Take that analogy and apply that to yourself or make it an analogy and apply it to yourself to the point where, man, I used to write on a pen and, pen and paper with a pen and paper and I didn't, I don't do this anymore. But back then life was good and now life is more difficult. And we are going to talk about getting older and the responsibility model that goes on top of us. But before we get there, I want you to design your life. Design it. You can be utterly crazy on a piece of paper. Utterly crazy. And what's interesting is you'll be amazed at the insane crap you'll write on a piece of paper that will come true. And some of the more subtle stuff that you thought would be, oh, that's low-hanging fruit. That stuff's the more impossible stuff to get. It's just weird. Now, one of the big ones that we don't do in this world, and it's getting worse and worse, but you can just neutralize this in two seconds just by changing your attitude, is that we are constantly pretending to be happy and pretending to have a perfect life and pretending to be, you know, have things that other people don't. A really funny story a buddy of mine told me. He was married to this girl, and they got divorced, and she took about a year off social media and then she came back and started posting and she still has his last name, which is interesting because it's not that hard anymore to go and refile your name and all this other stuff like it used to be. But anyway, she posts this photo album of her with a new guy. And they're at a really posh wedding. And I mean, it just, and I think that they had gained access to a really expensive car, if I remember right, in the photographs. And I saw it on my end, and he saw it in his end. And we had talked for several months, and we just talked last week for several, at least an hour and a half or so, several minutes. And he asked me, he goes, well, have you seen her? You know, just keep my eyes on her. And he goes, I finally talked to her about it. And, you know, he, he made the assumption that uh, this guy isn't as well off as these photographs make him look. And sure enough, she admitted, she, well, does it matter? You know, it doesn't really matter. But I mean, but she was posting this, this set of photographs as if this dude's a baller. I mean, I thought he was like mega rich or something, man. I literally thought that. Now, uh, my friend said, uh, he said the joke, don't tell me he lives in a one bedroom apartment by himself, right? She was does it matter? <laughs> you know, he's like, okay, okay. So the idea is we should be reaching out to our friends and family, at least your friends, right? When you're in sort of a funk. Because you never know what a kind word can do to sort of calm you down and help you reprioritize yourself. You just need someone else to say something. And that's hopefully this episode, if you're feeling trapped, gives you a little bit of food for thought. But someone who's very close to you that you respect can have a powerful impact on just redoing your perspective, you know? How many times have you broken up with somebody, boy, girl, whatever, and you talk to one of your friends and they say, you know, I'm not going to badmouth the other person. It sounds like this person wasn't right for you. And you know what? You're, you're still this incredible person. If anything, you identified what, what it was about that person's behavior that broke it off, even if they dumped you, you now can see the writing on the wall all of a sudden, as they say. And so now, as you approach a new relationship, you can keep your eyes open for that sort of behavior or just straight up address it on the first date and say, well, you know what? I just had this happen and I'm not looking forward to experiencing that again. So what do you think about that? How do you avoid that? And then voila, you've got sort of a foundation. Doesn't mean new things can't sneak in there. But make sure you under you, well. Make sure you understand that you have friends and family, and the only reason why they're called that is because they're useful to you. It doesn't mean you don't like people that aren't useful to you, but usually your friends are the kind of people that are willing to make sacrifices for you too. Okay, well they'll go. Well, you do that line of work, right? All right, okay. I got a couple friends of mine. You know, I'll make a few phone calls, and we'll see if I can't find a job for you in that realm. You just want to reach out as much as you possibly can. 
And it could be that you reach out to your friends and family, whatever, maybe more your friends so you can keep, you know, keep up appearances with your family. Although I just say it's a kiss of death. You never know. But you would know if your family knows somebody probably more than anybody. And, you know, you, they don't come back right away. And you find something to sort of get by or something to get you out of the trap. And your friends call later after you've recovered a little bit. Instead of being a life preserver, being thrown out to you while you're drowning, it's, it's frosting on top of the cake. It's frosting on top of the frosting because you already figured out a way to get around this feeling. So let's talk about getting older and acknowledging the fact that uh, youth provides a delusional perception of reality, doesn't it? I mean, and it, it, it should, it should, you shouldn't be burdened with adult stuff when you're a kid, but there's, every kid's different. And, you know, you should uh, think about when you raise a kid, how much you sort of let them peek into the, the world of the adult and say, you know, I want you to enjoy yourself today, but just understand there's going to be a point when I don't pay your bills anymore and you're going to have to have a job. So go and do something that educates you and something that you love so that when you have to go to school, you understand what subjects you'll be more interested in, and you'll just perfect your skills, and then poof, you get a job in what you love. Ideal situation, right? There's an old Twilight Zone. I just watched it. And it's about a guy, I think it's in first season too. It's about a guy who goes back to his hometown, and his car has a little issue. And so he's like, you know, he drops it off at the gas station. He's like, how long will that take to fix? He's like, I have about an hour and a half. He's like, okay, I'm going to go. I used to live in this town down the street. I'm going to go in there and just take a look around. You know, first thing he does is he goes into like the, the soda shop parlor with the ice cream and stuff. And he gets himself these three scoops and he's just reminiscing to this old man. He goes, man, you look familiar to me. You know, I used to come here all the time when I was a kid. I grew up here, you know, and it used to be like you get three scoops for a dime. Could you believe that? A dime? And so the dude serves him three scoops. And he goes, that'll be a dime. He goes, a dime? He goes, you're going to lose your shorts if you keep doing that. He goes, so here's a dime. And he tips the guy a dollar. And the guy says, this is a dollar, mister. And he says, yeah. Thanks a lot, man. He's in New York City. And he starts roaming around his hometown. And over the course of like five, ten minutes, he realizes, holy shit, this is my hometown when I was a kid. He finds himself carving his name in this gazebo thing in the park. And just after he told a woman, he goes, I carved my name over there. And all of a sudden he sees a kid doing it and it's him. And he tries to chase himself. He goes home and tries to talk to his parents who are long gone. And of course they're like, get out of here, you crazy nut. But the way that this thing, and I won't ruin the complete ending for you, but the, the moral of this episode is quite on point. You can't live in the past. Got to move forward. And a trap situation is a microcosm of this episode. You were going into this situation, uh, perhaps out of a, a better situation, into a situation. Maybe, you know, some traps, you know, right from the very beginning, you're going into a, a constraint situation. And, you know, you can find bliss eventually inside of a situation you thought wasn't going to be great. So that can happen, too. But maybe you went into a job and you loved it, and all of a sudden it kind of went stinky on you. And I've had that happen phew, two or three times, you know. And you, you get out because change happens. The world changes. Opportunities that weren't available when you were in the center of the storm, feeling totally trapped by the tornado going around you. You're like, I'm okay right here, but man, if I step out, I'm going to get hit by this thing. Things change. The tornado goes away. The winds slow down to the point you can walk through it, you know? But within this episode, the other, like, metaphysics of the episode, the subliminal message to adults, I believe in this message, was it was talking about, and this happens in other Twilight Zones, it's talking about the accruing of responsibility. As you get older, you accrue responsibility, crushing responsibility. You're supposed to, you know, procreate and have a family. So if you do that, then you've got all the burdens of that. Now, hopefully it's a wonderful experience, is uh, more so than it is a burden, burdening one. But if you didn't and you couldn't hook it up or it wasn't your choice, you still might have people, you know, putting pressure on you that you have to, especially if you're a female. 
But you're also supposed to own things. You may even want those things and you can't have them necessarily. Or if you do get them, now you got a payment that's just killing you. Hmm. How many of you would like to just have a, a beautiful warehouse somewhere that's dry and clean and well-kept and protected and you can take all your craft that's like irreplaceable, which is probably a lot smaller than you think, stuff it in there, get rid of all the junk that you've accrued, your car, your house, whatever it is, all this super pressurizing stuff. And then just go find a bungalow somewhere and rethink your life. And you're, my stuff is safe. I don't have all that crap I used to pay money for. I don't have a cell phone anymore. I don't got anything. No one's coming to me for a bill anymore. My uncle owns the warehouse. I'm just, I'm, I got the burdens of, burden of a homeless person, but I'm not homeless. And just rethink your life. All right, that's a fantasy. But the idea is a lot of us feel trapped and we do have safe haven for our stuff. So you kind of have the same thing. The only thing you're not doing, perhaps, is rethinking your life. Getting in there and re-engineering what you want. Not what I want for you, what you want for you. What I have found is this. It's really weird. And maybe this changes for me. But as I've said... <laughs> God, 700 episodes ago, I told you guys, look, I think the the universe considers you a business investment. And the business investment goes something like this, and there's multiple layers to it, but I would say at a minimum, it says, look, we'll invest in you if you invest in us. And by investing in us, they mean investing in yourself. I'll give you some examples. The most simple example would be you do not want to be in this situation and you're willing to work hard to get out of this situation. Sometimes that's all you need to commit to. And then the universe makes the phone ring. The universe provides you bait to test your resolve. And you got to take the bait. And you got to say, well, you know, my buddy's willing to give me a job, but it's not in something that I really want to do, but it does pay the bills and it's, you know, I can live with it. The second example is more specific, and this is where you can have a lot of fun with life. It takes some dedication. Learning new things isn't usually an overnight thing. You know, you know, there are some things like Blender. You can learn some stuff overnight that'll change your life, I'll tell you that much. But I, I usually use the guitar solo uh, example, or the guitar, yeah, guitar solo. So someone goes to a concert, I and mean, every, every guy in the world's thought this once, and there's some sort of instrument, but usually when I was young, it was the guitar could be the drums too. But you see someone rip up a guitar like Eddie Van Halen. And then you're like, man, I want to play like that. I would love to play like that. But you don't own a guitar. Okay. So first step, get a guitar. Second step, learn how to play it a little bit at least, right? Learn the theory of what you don't know so that you can start learning it. And if one teacher sucks, go get another teacher. And then if that person sucks, get another teacher. Maybe it's just your friend. Maybe you're Dave Grawl who says, I don't even know how to read music. I just understand patterns on this neck thing called a fret. He's obviously a drum player too. He's obviously a singer. He's obviously a songwriter. So the reason why a lot of these folks get what they're looking for is they push hard. They don't take no for an answer. And the no's come from outside, and the no's come from inside their head. And those things are going to happen. They're all organic, and you got to be able to pick yourself up again and continue going. When I write film, you know, I have never, uh, I've been hired to write two films. And when I write and they don't get made, I can't listen to that negativity. I got to go, well, this is what I love to do. So I got to just do it because it's what I love to do. And I'm constantly trying to find an interesting story to me. I have to love the film myself. I have to cry. I have to laugh. I have to do whatever, get excited. And then I think that someone else will have that same exact emotion. What's really interesting about sort of watching things on social media, because it's externalizing a lot of behavior of man that we can use to help ourselves, is that there's usually this sort of Competition, people who are competitive, I, I don't believe in competition personally. I understand it. I just think that if you 
put your head down and you really try really, really hard and you kick your own ass a lot, you will be competitive by nature, but you won't care about a, a blue ribbon or a trophy. You just It's just like, well, I just create cool shit. If you dig it, you dig it and you pay for it, you pay for it. That's cool. I'm not going to go to God going, I kicked that motherfucker's ass right there. Like, I'm not doing that. I've never been that kind of person. Some people are. And if you are, you could use this to your advantage. But a lot of people will sort of exude this behavior that's, I'm as good as you. I'm, I'm da, da, da. But they won't do it in their own lives. If someone can say, I'm as good as you, screw you. And you go, okay, great, awesome. Who else are you as good as? And they might say, everybody. We're all equal. Yeah, I think we're equal in different ways, quite frankly. We're equal. But the idea is to say, okay, these there aren't special genes out there that let you get things done. And then bad genes that you never get anything done. Nah, it's just the way you were brought up, the opportunities that you perceive that you have, because you had all the opportunities. And as soon as you wake up and go, oh, shit. You mean all the opportunities are my opportunities? Save, you know, maybe a youthful thing and you're a little old for things. Man, the the things that young people can do that you can't do is the minority group of things that can be done on this planet. So don't worry about, oh, I'm not 25 anymore. Yeah, who gives a shit? The stuff you could do at 25 was limited by the 25 intellect, unless you're gifted. Or, you know, you're, uh, again, even if it's a physical thing. Yeah, you probably won't be in the Olympics ice skating if you're 55 and you're a dude. Who cares? The stuff you can still do at 55 and be a, being a guy or, or 38 and you're a woman or whatever the age is, 80 and you're either sex, doesn't matter. You got a lot of options. One of the interesting ones, just as an example, and you know this is true, which is why I'm mentioning it, is people write books, don't they? People who never thought they'd ever write a book, write a book. And they sell the crap out of them sometimes. It's amazing. Sometimes it's about their life. Like, uh, was it Yaomi Parks who escaped North Korea? I'm not sure how old that girl is. She's probably late 20s, early 30s. She wrote a book about her experience, and I think she's coming out with a new one. Okay, you want to talk about a person who felt trapped? This girl was in... North Korea, and if you just listen to her story, she has a YouTube channel. And I wouldn't say she's right about everything that she perceives, but she's trying to be as correct as possible. But she talks about just, you know, her father going out and having to pull grass out of the ground to boil into the stew that they would eat when they didn't have food. The fact that every single person in Korea who's not a part of the uh, Pyongyang, you know, elite actors that parade around in nice dress to make foreigners feel comfortable as long as you're outside the main city you're stealing like crazy soldiers being the worst th thieves because they don't get enough food to eat and she showed some smuggled out footage of soldiers really really malnutrition is horrible and now this girl lives in america she said that a guy and her escaped and this dude threw himself on electrified barbed wire fence so she could crawl over his body to escape and she's not sure if he ever made it she's pretty sure he died that's amazing i mean that's like wow but she had to have the guts to even attempt it but her life was so bad she did it and she ends up coming to america i think she has a son and now she bounces around the planet and she looks fantastic. And somehow her mom got out too. So her mom poses with her and photographs all over the all over America. So you talk to someone like that, and boy, your your perception of being trapped is gonna be heavily adjusted. In two different ways. One, you may feel like, well, my life isn't that bad. But two, the delta between what she was experiencing, being in a concentration camp over there, and then being in, you know, New York City in a penthouse. Your ability to do it is just as equal as hers. You just have to acknowledge that in your system. Show the universe, okay, and maybe even just talk to the universe. I don't care if you're not a religious person, you don't believe in God or whatever, but if you do, boy, it really helps, you know. And you say, look, computer algorithm matrix, uh, I'm here and I'm willing to work and I'm willing to do what it takes to make it happen. I wrote down on this piece of paper five things that I would love to do. 
And it's not about buying possessions and getting a bunch of this and that that it may I don't really need. It's things that I want. It's these are the things that I need right here. And once you get the things that you need, you build that foundation, then you can build your high rise on top of that. But I guarantee you, if you've ever been rich and then you were broke and you get rich again, let me tell you, the joy of spending money on the second round is so much better because you're frugal. You buy more of what you need. You stack cash in the bank or some investment or something instead of blowing it all as fast as you make it. And you feel mature for the first time in your life. You're like, oh my God, I always wanted to know when I was getting more mature. And this weird up, down, up thing makes me feel more mature as a human being. It's proof that you made it. And you counted the steps and you figured it out. The thing is, is if you ever have done it before, you know for a fact that each time you pick yourself back up, even though it's no fun, sometimes, sometimes I guess it could be fun, but I don't, I don't think it is. I think you, you get exhausted and the older you get, you, you can convince yourself of all of the cliches of getting old. And I have to say, be very careful ever saying cliches that are detrimental to your existence. You know, like I used to say all the time on episodes, you know, I hate cliches like life's a bitch and then you die. Well, if you say that and you believe that, that's the life you're going to live. You know, everybody dies of cancer. All politicians are corrupt. Well, it's not that at that point, the predominant truth might agree with you. But the idea is you can dial out of this universe of negativity and literally wake up the next morning in a duplicate universe that is better with more opportunities. I have an old episode called Dreamscapes or Dreamscaping. I think it's season one, like within the first 20 episodes, if I remember right. But the whole thing is an exercise in this notion that when we go to sleep, the reason why we're forced to go to sleep, uh, in part, is that you have the opportunity to vibrate yourself to a better frequency, such that when you wake up, you're in a duplicate reality of your previous life. All the same friends, same stuff. Maybe even the the state of, of the bits in the hard drive are exactly the same. I mean, you got the same job and it sucks and all this other stuff. However, the next few seconds of being alive... You feel more joyous, you feel more hopeful, and you start seeing things clearer and clearer and clearer. And the big thing is to go to bed going, you know what? I am leaving this universe behind. And when I wake up, I'm going to be in this better universe. And yeah, it's going to stink the same way it did when I went to bed. But I know for a fact, the more steps that I take and the more people I talk to and the more I engage my life, those opportunities that I didn't have in the previous frequency are going to start showing up. Because I've taught the universe, I'm serious about my life. I got the guitar. I went through four teachers that sucked. And finally, I realized my neighbor is the guy. The key word to feeling trapped is change. And it's twofold. Just a review. The world's going to change the circumstances that are trapping you. Uh, A silly, stupid analogy would be you're in some sort of... uh, You're immortal and you're locked in a jail cell and eventually the building's going to fall around you and eventually the the bars are going to rust out of existence and you're going to walk out of that place. There's a trolley zone that's like that and the guy is immortal and he gets life in prison and he doesn't think it through. He immediately concedes and, and concludes his contract with the devil and goes to hell. Instead of just going, you know, I'm not going to hell. I'm going to wait for this fucking building to fall down before I leave this place, right? So life around you will change and get rid of the circumstances that are trapping you. The second thing that's going to happen is change is going to happen inside you. And you need to, you need to incubate it and augment the change. You need to push the pedal on the car to increase your acceleration, to increase your speed, to travel away from your trap inside your mind start playing with what could happen because if you do it's it's like my old analogy i used to say on the show where a friend of mine needed ten thousand dollars to move and i said okay i think it was 10 and i said well it's good that you now know that you need the ten thousand dollars because before you knew you needed it there was no hope of you ever getting it just out of the blue So now you know you need it. So now you start searching for it. 
you've already half the difficulty of getting your 10 grand because now you're actively pursuing. And maybe you don't get 10, maybe you only get 8,500 or whatever after busting your balls or whatever it is. It's a hell of a lot better than having no conception that you need it in the first place. So when you're trapped, it's not because you necessarily consciously said, I'm going to pick things that trap me. It's just, oh shit, I'm trapped. What the hell? You know? And then you do what every uh, MacGyver Doctor Who episode does and you go, we have to escape. I mean, it's so funny. All the Doctor Who episodes, uh, from the past at least, there's just, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of episodes where these guys get, the Doctor gets trapped with his companions and and it's like a hopeless situation. I, I know this is fictional, but the tenacity of the writers is the theme that we want to go after, which is... There's always an escape. There always is, right? All the Marvel movies that have been made, you know, there's somebody locked in a cage. Hannibal Lecter's locked in a cage with a mask on. Also, he figures out a way to get out. It's clever, right? The thing is, is we don't actually have typically those unescapable circumstances. Sometimes we just walk away from things and boom, we're not trapped anymore. Sometimes we change the way we feel inside, and that just makes things that we were concerned about not matter anymore. And all of a sudden, you're not trapped anymore. When you, you know, you're young, you care about what other people think about you a lot more than when you get older. You're worried about smithing every word that you say to make sure that everyone doesn't get butt hurt. And there's a famous quote by uh, Clint Eastwood. Where he said, you know, as I get older, I just, I... I care less about tiptoeing around people. And the, the subtext of that is, I'm not an asshole, is what he's saying. And I, I'm a fair-minded guy, so if I speak fairly and politely and you get butthurt, then that's your problem, not mine. Because you have to live with you, you know, in the end. I think it's important as a community of society that we talk like this every once in a while to ourselves and to each other. And just share any wisdom that we might have to sort of have a different perspective because that's all it is to really make things happen in life, you know. I will say again, again, as a repeat, we are now in the era of self-education. We have to. There's no way around it. There's no way around it. No matter what position you think you have, unless it's in an extremely creative position, realm like writing sitcoms for tv or movies or something where it's like man no robot's going to do this no ai is going to do this accurately um anytime soon and you know that probably means in your lifetime but right after your lifetime it will start happening right i mean we'll see if they're any good just remember if you're older things like youtube are the university of the gods i mean if you could take plato and bring him to this era and show him, you sit him down next to you uh, at a table and you've got a laptop. And you say, okay, Plato, name a subject that as you've seen this modern world and it blew your mind, name a subject that uh, you'd like to just see if there's a, an educational course out there for you. Take Leonardo especially, right? That dude. And he goes, oh, I saw the crafts fly in the sky. I was always trying to create a flying craft. This is Leonardo, right? And he goes, how do they do that? Okay, yeah, so aviation, aerodynamics. Da, 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 da. And you type it up. Well, there's a, here's a class on how, you know, the lift works in a wing. And, and here's a bunch of classes that come out of a college that teach you how to design planes. Here's another college that published a course on how to fix uh, jet engines. When I did the huge deep dive on the conspiracy that jet engines don't use as much fuel as they say, which is definitely the case. It's an 80-20 mix, 20% fuel, 80% ramjet air going through it, creating the, the, the thrust on the thing. You could show them. I mean, imagine and then say, what do you think about that? Let's go on something else. How does the water go through a pipe? Because he didn't see that before. You know, boom, here's how you do this, here's how you do this, here's how you do this. Any machine that you can think of, there's a course on how to build it, how to fix it. Just remember, when you're older, these aren't knee-jerk resources that you think of all the time. We're getting better. We are getting better at it. You might think, oh, I do want to write that book, but fuck, I have no idea how to write a book. 
Go look it up, man. You'll be blown away. There's blogs out there if you like to read it. There's videos out there if you like to have someone just show you. And yeah, you'll get crappy teachers, good teachers, whatever. In Blender, you get two-thirds videos just made by kids just roughing it in their bedroom. Or English is like their fourth language. God bless them. And it's not for you. Uh, so you find someone who's right in your wheelhouse. You subscribe and you watch the crap out of it. Unfortunately, all the side social media sites haven't really gained this quite viral education side of the game, but, you know, we'll see. I think the good news goes something like this. If you are in a trap situation, you feel that way. The good news is you couldn't remain trapped if you wanted to, and the principle by which frees you is change. Everything's going to change. Your attitude's going to change. The world's going to change. What you care about today, you may not have the care in the world about it, you know, a year from now, a month from now, but definitely probably not five years from now or 10 years from now. And I, w I will add this to it because I've seen this one quite a few times in my lifetime. Someone feels trapped. They uh, actually weren't as trapped as they thought. A big one is relationships when you're young. You can't appreciate what you've got until you lose it sort of thing. And so they screw up and they mess up the relationship and they lose it. And in order to sort of counteract that self-evaluation going really bad to say, look how stupid I was. I had something wonderful and I lost it. They rush out and get into a new relationship just to put a band-aid on the previous experience. Now, the one they have is not horrid necessarily. It could be. It could get that way. Who knows? But then they feel trapped again. But then how they won't leave the relationship because that'll prove their double failure and that will reinforce them. And what they do in that second relationship is they think about the first. And even though they're with their new wife or new husband, they're ooing and aahing over the person they used to be with, putting that person up on a pedestal in a way they would never want you to or deserve in the first place. So the moral of that story is the following. As you change your life to get out of a trap situation or plan to get out of a trap situation, take your time. And you may need to pay your bills yesterday and taking time is no more than where you would write a, uh, your favorite things on a piece of paper in two minutes and like, that's what I need, that's what I want. You take one hour to do it. That's going to be 30 times more time than you would have taken the first time. You were going to just write them down and walk away from it. Think about it. Think about, is your list really your list? And if it is your list, then take the first item, get a fresh piece of paper, okay, Write that at the top and then write down every single step that you think you need to do in your life to get that first step. And what's crazy about it is I'll talk about this easy shit and people will go, fuck that, I'm not writing down a piece of paper. That's so stupid. And then they stay trapped. They stay in that lost state of being. So, okay, so try my way once and then tell me how horrible it was because <laughs> you'll find out it's not so bad. And what's funny about it is a lot of you have good enough memories that when you write down these giant lists, you're not necessarily carrying the list around with you. You're not blowing it up and putting it on your wall. You remembered it by writing it down in an analog, non-digital form. You, you carry that list in your head the whole time. And you might get it back out because you wrote 30 things that you have to do to get this one goal. And you're like, oh, what was 28 again? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And you'd be like, oh, I added, you know, I'm going to add five more that I ended up having to do to get those other ones to work. Here's the trick, though. If you get it to work one time, if you can untrap yourself one time, or if you already have untrapped yourself one time, lean on that experience and that confidence that you can do it. Because you can, right? And I am the last person on earth that will tell you that you can do something that you can't. What I've talked about on this episode is... In my opinion, all low-hanging fruit stuff. You just got to do it. And I tell you what, once your planning starts working, what's really funny about it is 
as you go to work on that job you hate or you're in a situation you don't, maybe you live in a place you don't like and you're researching real estate outside the place, you're looking for jobs outside and you start getting bites and you got people who are like, yeah, you know what, just, just come on over. I got a whole separate bedroom. I got plenty of room in my garage for all your crap. Just just come over here. We can have some fun while you're resetting. Then you go to work and it doesn't matter anymore. All those assholes that treat you wrong or, or that rub you wrong, you don't have to even say anything because the secret is you're going to quit. And immediately your life's going to get better, <laughs> you know? There is that weird kiss of death that it, uh, if you talk about something, it kills it. Mm. I think there's some truth to that. I'm not quite sure how that works. I got friends of mine that talk talk game and it fails and other people talk games and it works. So there must be some magic to that whole thing. In my experience, keeping it a secret is kind of fun. Because then you surprise everybody in hopefully a positive way, you know. Most of all yourself. So, anyhow, if you guys have any thoughts of wisdom, please, you know, add it to the comments so that we can kind of share. Because uh, I think this is one of those community experiences we all have, and we feel isolated when it happens. And, man, you guys could put together a couple sentences here and there, and someone could really feel like they're in a mutual experience that you're having or have had in the past. I just want to bring this up because, you know, it happens to me every once in a while. And it can happen just for a couple minutes. It can happen for a couple days, a couple years. My experience, I have never been able to stay down. It just self-corrects, you know. God has said in the Bible, right, he said, uh, you know, don't worry. Why worry about yourself and your needs when the birds and the fish get all their food and sustenance from the universe? Uh, obviously man has made it difficult for man to make that an absolute truth, but I do think there's a lot of wisdom to it. So anyway, if you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. Everything's up there. Bookmark it just in case we get moved around. And uh, to all the Patreon and PayPal people, thank you so much. You make everything happen. Take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over and out.